Hi, I'm Mark Himmelstein. I am the CTO for Risk Five, and I am very happy to be here at the Rios Risk Five Open Source Forum. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the road ahead for Risk Five, including where we're going and uh, and a bit about open source. Uh, so what is Risk Five, and what is the Risk Five open source effort? Uh, why open source is fundamental to risk by success, what's in store for 2021, and a little bit about our group contributor model. So what is RISC-V and the RISC-V open source effort? So RISC-V's origin story is it started in Berkeley and it started in 2010, uh, simple to implement, you know, I call it simple and elegant, and it really makes a very big difference. We've heard recently at the RISC-V summit how, um, people have been able to implement the extensions uh, much more easily on RISC-V than other architectures. And it turns out that many people wanted the same thing. So in 2016, uh, we created the, the foundation which became RISC-V International last year. Uh, and uh, we, as you'll see in a couple of moments, it has turned into a fairly global and very big effort. So what's the difference about RISC-V? So RISC-V is simple. So uh, you'll see in a second, the size compared to other ISAs. We started from scratch. So we got to stand on the shoulders of all the architectures that came before us, both RISC and CISC. So MIPS and Spark and Open uh, you know, Power and, and um, Spark, uh, HPPA, uh, Alpha, so on and so forth, as well as x86 and ARM. Um, and we've avoided having the microarchitecture be part of it. So the, we, we really, in RISC-V, you'll see, we really work on the, uh, uh, the implementation independent pieces. And this is meant to last for 50 years. We really mean that. The way we've uh, developed it with flexibility and, and uh, extensions, so there's a, a base set of extensions, um, and then we're working on, on the next generation of extensions, uh, and uh, this is all really designed by the community, and that really makes a very big difference. With Linux, there's an incredible pride of ownership. We have the same thing in RISC-V. Um, we're fond of saying that uh, we are Linux of the, the hardware world. So, uh, you know, in 1990, it, you know, you could lose your job for, for doing Linux. In the year 2020, it's a no-brainer. It's going to be the same way with RISC-V. We start out uh, emerging, and then uh, it's going to be a no-brainer in in, uh, in in like five years or or, or ten years at the latest. Um, so, really, um, we talk about unconstrained opportunity because the business model is really different. The cost of entry is different. Uh, there aren't you know partner limitations, there aren't supply chain limitations you can pick your own vendors to do all that stuff. You can design your own stuff. You can fab your own stuff. You can go to third parties to do that. You can uh, get the tool chain. You can get uh, you know, device verification. There's a whole ecosystem around us and that enables our um, uh, uh, members and the people who are producing products, implementers, uh, to go ahead and uh, produce things more quickly. So the time to innovation is shorter um, and they have a lot more at their disposal, a lot more choices at their disposal, and they are not, uh, you know, given very few choices that they have to follow. And, and in the meantime, they potentially can't solve the problem they need to do for their product. So a little bit about the organization. Um, there are over 230 organizational members at this point, a thousand individual members. There's 40 technical groups developing uh, extensions and the ecosystem around it. And there's about 1800 technical contributors who are signed up uh, to either participate or, or watch what those groups are doing. Um, they're all members. Uh, and so there's potentially multiple from, from one company. Um, but uh, this is a, a little bit of a picture of what we do. We have two ISA committees, the Unprivileged Committee and the Privileged Committee, and they have a bunch of groups underneath them that are developing things. So the Unprivileged, as you might imagine, it did all the integer stuff, uh, multiply divide, uh, atomic operations, all the floating point stuff, uh, compressed stuff. And now we're working on a whole bunch of other extensions. We're gonna talk about what's gonna be there 
for um, uh, 2021 at the end of this talk. And then the privilege stuff, you know, we did all the basic stuff, all the CSRs and uh, how, how do you do, um, uh, you know, context switches, exceptions and interrupts and so on and so forth. Uh, that was done in a 1.11 uh, um, uh, version. We're working on 1.12 now. We're going to break that out to individual extensions. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of uh, extensions that have been broken out and working as separate groups. Uh, so after that, we have a whole bunch of horizontal committees. What does horizontal mean? Horizontal means it goes across. So these go across all of the groups that are creating extensions for the ISA. So if you're doing bit manipulation, the B extension, uh, you need software done. So we have a software committee that, uh, that has a bunch of groups underneath it that uh, make sure that there's compilers and operating systems and everything else that work uh, with the bit manipulation extension. And that has to be in place before ratification. Uh, same thing's true with security. Uh, RASD is uh, reliability, availability, serviceability, and uh, diagnosability. Uh, the technology uh, um, uh, horizontal committee is, uh, you know, for market sectors like embedded or HPC or data center. Um, the uh, SOC infrastructure are things like debug and trace, IOMMU, and so on and so forth. The implementation one makes sure that we're um, actually designing stuff and 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 uh, defining stuff in the specifications. They're actually implementable and implementable reasonably. And then the ISA infrastructure does things like architectural tests and formal models and continuous integration and and documentation. Uh, in addition, we have uh, an industry verticals group. Uh, and they're, think of them as inbound product management, and they're working to get data from the industries about, hey, do we have everything you need to succeed? And, uh, you know, a number of these things have just got off the ground. The things you see with red boxes are things that are, you know, pending and just getting off the ground. The things with black boxes are very well established and underway. And if you want more information about it, feel free to contact us at helpirisk5.org uh, at any time, and we'll be glad to give you more information. So uh, we are disruptive technology. Like, how does this work? How do you become disruptive technology? Well, the legacy ISAs, as I said, we stand on their shoulders, but you know they've been around for a long time and they have a lot of instructions and the, the baggage that comes along with that restricts them uh, from uh, version to version uh, about how well they can do and how easy it is to change things and add things and so on and so forth. We start out with 47 base instructions. It's modular. We can add extensions incrementally. People can pick and choose which extensions they want to uh, go ahead and, and support. We have groups of extensions that are uh, standard for a year, the same way that you might have uh, something like RMV8. We have uh, you know, RVA20 um, for all the things that are ratified in 2019, and we're going to go through that in a minute or two. Um, and our, you know, obviously, we're open source, so our, our uh, uh, royalties are free. And, and you can do anything you want. You can make whatever decisions you want. And everything's growing rapidly. We have a lot of people involved uh, in the ecosystem. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So I like to say that uh, RISC-V is uh, a, uh, like, a, like a, uh, a glacier. And what does that mean? It means that the, uh, the, the oops, sorry about that. Uh, this file is like a glacier. And uh, what, what that means, I'm just trying to shrink my, my little video window here. So it's not in the way of the, the presentation. Uh, but the, the shiny part that you see above the water, that's the ISA. That's done by the architects. It's really uh, heavy duty work. And these guys have a lot of experience. Most of the folks have been working in, in, in other architectures in their lives. They're very experienced people and they're helping us. And when you go to these meetings, it's just amazing uh, the intelligence and the brilliance uh, and the common sense that, that these folks have. And then the stuff underneath the water, the big thing, that's the ecosystem, okay? And our ecosystem kind of has two parts. One part is the open source ecosystem and the stuff that's really implementation independent. Um, and, and those are, you know, listed here. I'm not going to read through them. Uh, but the RISC-V community and group contributors, where I'm going to talk about those later, uh, help us get those done. Uh, in addition, there are things that are implementation dependent. We don't do those, but there's obviously a bunch of things that you have to do in order to actually put out a product. And we have other nonprofit organizations, if you're interested in open source, that enable you to go ahead 
and um, uh, you, you know use use that um, you know, use their stuff, and 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 they have open source licenses as well. But we're also trying to make sure that there's a, a way for people to make money, and so. Uh, even in the software open source ecosystem, there are commercial products and services and vendors. There, there are vendors out there that, that provide, for example, services that help you use uh, GCC. Uh, there are vendors out there who have uh, tool chains that are targeted specifically towards embedded and they're, they're for profit places and you have to pay for, for use of their stuff. Um, similarly, uh, down in the, uh, the actual production piece, the, the actual you know, creating of things, the implementation, the design, fabrication, so on and so forth. Uh, there are uh, companies that will sell you IP, they'll sell you chips, they'll sell you end systems or integrated um, uh, SOCs. And, and so the whole point of our doing this is so those folks can innovate and make money and that you as members can find a way to make money. And that, that's really what this is all about. It's the same way as Linux. I mean, the idea is that everybody shares and, and you don't duplicate effort, and then people get to innovate and release Linux on their product. This is the same kind of model. So um, in 2020, um, we uh, ratified a bunch of extensions, all the base extensions. You can see them down here at the bottom, this RV32 and RV64 with these nice long strings. So, I or you know integer stuff, so load, store, add, subtract, so on and so forth. M is multiply and divide. Uh, A is atomic operations. F, D, and Q are floating point uh, different uh, 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 you know widths, uh, and then compressed instructions. We also did a bunch of privileged architecture work. Then uh, we did a memory model, and we had had a, a debug spec, so you can actually run debuggers and you know debug implementations and so on and so forth with it. Um, we're formalizing that into set profiles. So we're going to have groups that will have uh, um, required, optional, unsupported, and incompatible extensions. And for every one of these profiles you see here for RVA20, and that's the generic name we give for both 32 and 64, RVA20, but you can just use the 32 piece or the 64 piece. And, and that's for the application layer stuff. So that's that level stuff. So that's like running on Linux. The microcontroller is more like either bare metal or simple RTOS. Um, and then if you have uh, gone ahead and produced a product, you're allowed to say that you're RBI 20 compatible. And that's the base instruction profile, which is uh, the, the 47 instructions that we talked about on the other slide. So the next part of this talk is really about how open source is fundamental to risk five success. And um, this part of the presentation, you know, we've given a number of times and, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully you guys can you know, go ahead and use this in, in your discussions with other people. Uh, but I think it represents not only risk five, but open source in general. So the context here is that risk five is a community, right? We deal with open source. I mean, the ISA is open source. Um, and anybody can use it in any way, shape, form they want. Um, and we have a whole bunch of ecosystem things that we talked about already on that, on that great Glacier slide that have upstreams. So GCC has its own project and people work within RISC v uh, but uh, before it gets ratified, it has to be upstream to the uh, GCC project. And so we have a lot of things that are upstreamed, as you might imagine, operating systems and runtimes and compilers and so on and so forth. But we have some things that are unique to RISC V and live in RISC V and those are things like architectural tests or uh, formal models. So we try to give people guidance on when to do something in open source and why not. But ultimately it's, it's, it's each company's choice what they do. We don't tell them they have to. We're telling them, hey, look, for you to get the best value out of RISC V, um, you have to be a good open source uh, contributor as well as, as user, right? And you got to do both because if you don't do that, then uh, what will happen is you're going to see a lot of duplication in various places and less time to innovate. I mean, why do you have to have yet another set of bit manipulation instructions or compilers that use bit manipulation instructions? Let's share that work. It's been done, you know, a, a thousand times. 
right? Then there are places where you want to go ahead and really uh, add value, like uh, you know the stages of your pipe or how many uh, instructions you can issue at the same time or what the what the, the uh, interface looks like to memory or to I/O. And so uh, it's important to you know balance those things out. So the philosophy is. Um, you can achieve fast time to market with your own added value by playing in as a good open source um, community uh, member, right? And so, uh, you know, I, I like to say there's a, a bumper sticker statement, more innovation, less duplication. That's what this is about. So <laughs> what does collaboration look like? What does it cover? So um, in our world, it's, it's really about that ecosystem, that part beneath the water, simulators, architectural tests, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so there's all those things that we talked about, um, but there's also, um, uh, you know, advice that we give, how best practices on how to interact with it. There are certain uh, license assignments you need to do to work with the Free Software Foundation, for example. Um, we want to make sure that we suggest minimum viable implementation stuff so that uh, people understand uh, what they need to do to make RISC-V look its best. Well, I mean, you could say you're not going to spend time helping other people understand that, uh, but the truth is that is a common denominator thing and it isn't added value and it helps the whole community. Um, and then we have uh, the connection to the other nonprofits we talked about. Uh, there's a bunch of them out there. There's uh, open hardware, low risk, uh, Chips Alliance, so on and so forth. And, and there's just a ton of them out there, a lot of them doing RISC-V uh, related work. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're really um, uh, trying to make sure that uh, we enable this for-profit piece. That in the end is the ultimate goal. And so uh, we're trying to make it easy for all those folks to go ahead and create products and sell them to their customers and have their customers be happy. So what does collaboration mean? So uh, we talk about collaboration in a lot of ways. One is we collaborate in the committees uh, to design the ISA uh, uh, portions or to figure out what we're gonna do with the ecosystem. Uh, we agree on the work, uh, we share the code um, and, and we, we try to get people to not keep it in their private repositories. We try to get them to put it in the risk five repositories as early as possible so people can collaborate. I mean, you may not do all the work and if you're doing some piece of work in your private directory and somebody else is doing their private work in their directory, uh, then you're gonna have to pay some integration costs when they eventually come back together. And finally, we, we have to get things upstreamed uh, for um, uh, you know, open source projects like LLVM or GCC. Um, and then once it's uh, deployed, we get to share you know, the maintenance effort. Um, and then you know, finally, uh, it, it has a lot to do with communication. We, we are global, we're around the world, people with different time zones, people with different languages. Um, there are lots of challenges. We work very hard to make it clear where to communicate, how to communicate, and how you get uh, information to succeed. So um, where can you go ahead and do these four profit things? One is uh, in, in the hardware, right? There's a lot of design stuff uh, in the software. Uh, you can have uh, private versions of these that are targeted towards a, a particular thing that are you know, above GCC or services where you're actually supporting you know, some uh, open source project or you're doing some custom design for people or verification or training, so on and so forth. So in the end, you, you know, we're trying to get people to go to market with interesting things. It doesn't matter whether it's a low powered version of something or whether it's a, uh, you know, something that just runs faster than anything else in the world. Uh, we're trying to enable people to do that. Um, and the only way that works is if we have, you know, um, the open source versions around, um, but we also allow for proprietary versions. So people who are in the business of, you know, again, for example, making compilers or tool chains for embedded, they uh, can um, you know, make money they can make profit. We don't want to disable those marketplaces. So, you know, why should you do it? You know, sometimes it's not obvious to people, especially if you've not played in the open source world. And, you know, a bunch of you have done that already. You understand the propositions, but 
some may not. So, or some people you're working with may not. So number one is time to market, right? Um, you know, um, you could say, hey, um, time to market is a added value for my company. I can go ahead and do the GCC changes and get my product out quicker by holding it off. And eventually I'll give it to, um, uh, to um, uh, the open source world. Uh, that just hurts everybody. And, and sometimes it's not obvious, but it actually helps your time to market because other people are going to contribute and help you get out to market on things that you can't work on. And we can't work on everything. That's why communities grew up in the 90s. And this is an ongoing str struggle, even in Linux. You know, Linux at various times wags his finger at people saying, you held that stuff too long, right? And he's trying to get them to give things earlier. Um, a lot of times there's not going to be a material difference. And I talked about bit, bit manipulation. It's been around a long time. It's not going to make a difference where you're doing code generation uh, in one compiler or another. It's going to be fairly similar. Um, and if you're working in open source tools or operating systems, it has to be upstreamed at some point because you are required to do that. Uh, the earlier you do that, the more it helps the community. And in the end, maintenance dominates software costs. So the first time you do something, yeah, it costs you. But the truth is, if you have problems when you put things out in the field, uh, that costs more than anything else because it could be reputation, it could be recalls, it could be a customer dissatisfaction. Um, but uh, it's always much better to fix problems before the product goes out. And the way we do that is by helping each other. So the call to action here is evaluate your current work, um, see if it can be done in open source, uh, sure early and often. So that's the end of this section. I'm gonna go and start talking a little bit about what's in store for 2021 um, and then go on to the group contributor stuff. So um, as I alluded to before, I, I showed this slide before, we're, we're you know, creating these profiles. Uh, we're doing some of it remedially because we defined stuff in 2019. We didn't define what profiles were. And so at the end of 2019, we had a set of extensions. They're going to go into this uh, RBA 20 and RBM 20. Um, and they're in the process of being defined right now. And the four categories that I talked about required, optional, unsupported, and incompatible. But 2022, it's even bigger. And so for the first time, uh, the technical leadership is uh, from the top down saying, this is what we want to accomplish this year. Now this year is kind of a little funny because a bunch of things were in flight and we have to make sure that we take care of them. Uh, but the goal is in the future, we actually uh, provide top level guidance with a bunch of input from that in industry SIG, the sort of the product management inbound. So what's coming? Well, uh, and what's included? So the 2020 profiles are obviously part of the 2022 profiles because they inherit all that stuff. Uh, but you know, one of the great big things is vector um, it's, it's an amazing implementation. There was a great talk at Summit. You can still see that on our um, uh, you know, Summit page. Uh, uh, crypto, we're working on both Scalar and, and, um, and Vector. Um, if you take AES-128, it takes a, uh, you know, like without these things, it takes over a thousand uh, instructions to go kind of one th cycle through the loop. Um, and uh, with, um, with the crypto scaler gets it down to 75 instructions, and that's you know good because it, it requires less of a footprint than vector, um, and and maybe more uh, accommodating to embedded situations. And then there's crypto vector, which gets it down to one instruction, so over a thousand instructions down to one. Amazing stuff. Uh, bit manipulation. It was a piece that was missing from the beginning, and and we're we're filling that in. Uh, Pack um, uh virtual memory. So uh, you know, uh, figuring out what the page table entries and the TLB kind of looks like and the instructions to control them and so on and so forth. Similarly with cache management operations. So again, you, you have your freedom to go ahead and do your virtual memory or cache any way you want, but there's common operations that are needed no matter what. And these things define those. So we're all sharing that work. Uh, alternate floating point uh, formats. So there's things like bfloat16 that are very, very important to things like ML down the bottom in, in embedded. Uh, and then there's a more general code size reduction and embedded support effort uh, that's, uh, you know, finding, uh, you know, a, a bunch of instructions that uh, shrink uh, the footprints. Um, and, uh, and they're a very active team and, and, and people are very involved. 
uh, trusted execution environment. Um, they're doing uh, PMP, IO PMP, and, and a bunch of other things. And then their JIT support instructions. And there's some others that I, that I, that I didn't put up here. It's, it should be dot, dot, dot. Um, uh, so there, there's going to be a, a fairly big list for 2022. And we call it 2022 because all the work is done in 2021, but it comes official on January 1st of 2022. Um, and then we're going to have platform definitions. And so what's a platform? A platform, uh, it, it helps you limit the variations for distros. Um, you don't want to have Red Hat being told by 10 different vendors to do 10 different things to support you know, their platform. So we're coming up with a common platform definition so they could do fewer variations. Uh, and it's a complete description so that you know, software at various levels can optimize and customize for the platform. The initial targets will likely be a Linux development um, a cert, a Linux development uh, 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 platform and a uh, some kind of RTOS. We haven't decided which one yet, but very shortly after that, we're going to do a Linux server or um, you know other servers or other RTOS related things. Uh, but you'll see some more come out over time. But we need to walk before we run. So what's the content? Well, obviously the profiles have to be in there. You got to know which instructions you got. Um, the binary interfaces, so the ABIs, the EABIs, the SB, SBIs, so on and so forth. Um, how you discover what's in your machine, uh, the device tree, which is integral to how Linux, you know, uh, configures itself, uh, and then they're defining the rest of the things that are going to be content. So look for that coming mid-year. The plan for that, and both of these, both the profiles and the platforms, will finalize November fifteenth for announcement at the summit in December, and for being official January first. So now I'm going to talk about group contributors. This is my last topic for the day. Thank you for, for uh, sitting through this. Uh, so remember, I said, uh, you know, there's this stuff beneath the water. That's the ecosystem. Well, it turns out that the ISA really needs to be done by architects, people with a lot of experience in ISAs. You can't have beginning people doing that. You need people who've just done it before and, and know what the gotchas are, know what the variations are, know how to cover all the bases. Those people have also been doing all the ecosystem work. And uh, when we were doing an analysis uh, this year of you know, why things were delayed, it turned out that we had architects doing stuff that developers could do. And so, uh, so we decided to uh, find a way to get people to help them do the work that developers can do um, uh, to help this community. And so we came up with the group contributor model. So what is it? Uh, first of all, it's a partnership. It's a partnership between some organization or institute who are willing to support a technical group that's developing extensions with a particular technology. So you might help in compilers or architectural tests or formal models or operating systems, so on and so forth. Uh, we develop a, a statement of work. Um, there's an acceptance criteria and there's a leader from the group contributor. Um, as well as from the risk five group that's and they jointly manage the effort and there's mutual benefit i mean the two biggest ones are a it's a learning opportunity and uh and and there's recognition so that helps the group contributors and then on the risk five side we get resources to complete the work that otherwise would have delayed the extensions and so right now we have um three uh, groups that are um, uh, working on uh, uh, proof of concepts and starting to work on other things. Um, and I just want to point out our hosts here, Rios, uh, have picked up a very difficult thing. So they picked up the privileged specification formal model architectural tests. We hadn't done that work. And so uh, they are coming up to speed and uh, we, we are very excited about it. Um, uh, we're making some good progress. And uh, you know, I hope the next time I get a chance to talk to you guys, I get to report on, on, on all that has been done in this arena. Uh, but we also have, have work in other areas and uh, we, we need more. We have five more, five more that we're recruiting. Uh, if you know of other folks who could help us um, or your organizations are, who are helping already can help us more, uh, we, we do need your help. There is a lot to that iceberg underneath the water. Well, that, that's, that's it for my talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, and um, I'm sure we'll have some kind of question and answer uh, opportunity. So again, thank you very much to Rios, and uh, um, I want everybody to be really excited about RISC-V.